The Space Launch System is the most powerful rocket NASA has ever built in its history, and the most powerful rocket to ever enter into operation. On its very first mission, it successfully sent the Orion spacecraft 434,522 kilometers away from the Earth. It is the current backbone of NASA's new Artemis lunar program and will be sending astronauts back to the moon for the first time since Apollo 17 in 1972. But this isn't the first time NASA has told this story. 18 years ago, NASA had a different program and a different rocket designated to also send the Orion spacecraft and its crew of astronauts to the moon for the first time since Apollo. Its name was Constellation and the rocket was known as Ares 5. This fact has not gone unnoticed to many people, and on the surface, both Ares 5 and SLS look incredibly similar, prompting many people to assume that SLS is simply a rebranding of the old Constellation era Ares 5. But is this actually true? Is SLS just Ares 5 reborn, or does it represent something new altogether? This is SLS versus Ares 5. Before we start comparing SLS and Ares 5, we first have to understand where these two rockets even come from. And for that, we have to go all the way back to the Space Shuttle. The Space Shuttle was NASA's workhorse rocket from 1981 all the way up until 2011. For 30 years, this machine powered all of NASA's human spaceflight missions and many of its other missions over 135 different flights. But the design of the Space Shuttle was very unconventional, and from the very start of the program, many different designs began to float around for how to turn the Space Shuttle into a more traditional inline rocket. These early designs are the beginning of what we know now as shuttle-derived launch vehicles, and while only two ever ended up flying, those being Ares 1X and the SLS, many different designs and concepts were actually brought into the world. The first serious endeavor to actually develop and fly a shuttle derived vehicle was the Constellation Program. I've actually already made a video about the Constellation Program, and a link to it should be appearing in the title card above, so I won't be covering it in depth here, but what I did not cover in that video is the origins of the Ares 1 and Ares 5 rockets, the two shuttle derived vehicles that were going to power this Constellation Program. In short, the Ares-1 and Ares-5 rockets can trace their origins to the 758-page Exploration Systems Architecture Study, otherwise known as the ESAS paper, that looked into how the new NASA administration would accomplish the goals laid out in the Vision for Space Exploration. To that end, the paper recommended two different rockets, the Crew Launch Vehicle, or the CLV for short, and the Cargo Launch Vehicle, or the CALV for short. The CLV is the origins for what we now know today as the Ares-1, but what we are going to be focusing on today is the Calvi, which was the origin of the mighty Ares 5. Initially, this Calvi rocket was designed quite similarly to what we have today for the SLS rocket, utilizing two five-segment solid rocket boosters, a core stage featuring a hydrogen tank and an oxygen tank approximately the same length and width as the SLS core stage, along with the same RS-25 engines mounted to the bottom and an upper stage of the same diameter. The biggest differences between this Calvi and a modern SLS is that there were to be five RS-25 engines instead of the four currently on SLS today, and that the vehicle was never designed with crew rating in mind due to the CLV being the one to take astronauts to orbit. On the surface, this makes the Cal-V seem quite similar to SLS, but don't be fooled. This rocket is about to become radically different as the years go on, changing most aspects of its design to better aid the program it was a part of. And the very first thing about the Cal-V to change was its name. On June 30th, 2006, NASA officially announced names for both the CLV and the CALV, renaming both rockets as Ares 1 and Ares 5 respectively, and from that point onwards, the former CALV would balloon in size to become the biggest rocket NASA had ever designed, and the biggest rocket seriously considered by anyone until the SpaceX Starship of the 2020s. While this Ares 5 rocket did stick to the traditional stage and a half design from the Space Shuttle, almost nothing from the original Space Shuttle was left by the time the program had run its course. The first thing to go were the five RS-25s, being replaced initially by five more powerful RS-68s, only to then add a sixth later on. Yet, despite using more powerful engines and more of them, this still simply was not enough power for the vehicle as the payloads kept getting heavier and heavier. 
To address this, they increased the lengths of the boosters by an additional half segment each, lengthening the core stage in the process to become 221 feet long. But what's more, ne different to nearly every other shuttle-derived rocket ever proposed, the core tank was widened to a massive 33 feet in diameter, the same as the Saturn V. The upper stage quickly followed suit, growing in diameter as well. What was left was a rocket that hardly resembled the original proposal at all, and was far larger than our modern SLS could ever hope to be. Speaking of SLS, let's get right into the primary purpose of this video, comparing SLS to Ares 5. Looking at the two vehicles side by side, we can see there is quite a lot of major differences between these two rockets. The first and most obvious difference is that Ares 5 is not crew rated while SLS is, as can be seen by the Orion spacecraft mounted to the top of the rocket. As we've previously discussed, Ares 5 is just a renamed Cal-V, with Cal-V of course meaning cargo launch vehicle. This will be very important later on, but right now it's just one of the many differences between these two vehicles. Moving down the rocket, we arrive at the upper stages of both vehicles. These are fairly similar to each other as they both have a payload fairing for cargo and are hanging tank designs, that being a design where the LOX tank hangs underneath the LH2 tank as opposed to a common bulkhead like with the S4B, but the EDS for Ares 5 is much wider at 33 feet in diameter and utilizes a single J2X engine, whereas the EUS for SLS is just 27.5 feet in diameter and uses four RL10C3 engines. Continuing down, we arrive at the core stage, and while they are both Hydrolox designs, that is about where the similarities begin and end. Just like the upper stage, the core stage for Ares 5 is 33 feet in diameter, as opposed to the 27.5 foot diameter of SLS. In addition to this, it is also longer than the SLS core stage as well, at 221 feet in length, as opposed to the 212 feet of the SLS core stage. Why is it longer? Well, that brings us to the next difference, the SRBs. The SRBs are the two things that these rockets actually do share in common, both being derived from those of the space shuttle, but slightly modified, although it's not a one-to-one, -one, as the SRBs of Ares 5 do have an additional half segment to them, which in turn lengthen the core stage of the vehicle. And lastly, we arrive at the bottom of the rocket, their engines. SLS uses four of the traditional RS-25s that powered the space shuttle, while the Ares 5 uses six RS-68 engines. That's quite a lot of differences, but it's not all of them. Let's take a look at some numbers. Ares 5 would have produced a total thrust at liftoff of 11.4 million pounds, while SLS only plans on going up to around 9.5 million pounds of thrust. As for LEO capacity, Ares 5 would have been able to put a mind-boggling 180 metric tons into low Earth orbit, as opposed to the 130 tons planned for SLS. And finally, for the TLI capacity, Ares 5 would have been capable of sending 71 tons on a translunar injection, while SLS will be capable of somewhere beyond 45 tons once it's finished development. And with that, it should become fairly obvious that SLS and Ares 5 are two completely different rockets, sharing almost nothing in common with each other. The fact of the matter is, these rockets are simply not even related to each other at all. But wait, I hear you say. Sure, SLS is wildly different from Ares 5, but it's pretty clear that when Ares 5 was cancelled, NASA simply went back to the original Cal-V and renamed it SLS, right? After all, didn't you recently just show us how similar those two rockets are, right? Well, here's the thing. It's actually impossible for the Cal-V to have been the ancestor of SLS. And as a consequence, it's actually impossible for there to have been any relation between SLS and Ares 5. But impossible is a very strong word. How can I be so certain that SLS is completely unrelated to Ares 5, and even to the very similar looking Cal-V? Well, that's because there's another rocket, a different rocket, a rocket that came around about the same time as the Cal-V for the purpose of replacing the space shuttle program. This rocket was known as Jupiter, and if that name sounds familiar to you, that's because it should, as I've actually already done a video on that particular rocket that you can check out once you've finished watching this one. Just like the Cal-V, the Jupiter rocket was also considered in the ESAS paper, 
Designated as LV-24 through 26, it competed directly against the Calvi, which was designated as LV-27.3, but for a number of reasons it was not selected, and the ESAS recommended LV-27.3 along with LV-13.1, the Calvi, and CLV, soon to become the Ares-5 and Ares-1. But as we've discussed in depth today, eventually the Ares-5 became far too big for its own good and inevitably came crashing back down and NASA was forced to look into other options. This brings us to the Augustine Commission, where a number of other rocket designs were considered to replace Ares-1 and Ares-5, and Jupiter actually makes a comeback here as one of the designs presented. But the most interesting thing to come out of this was that, introduced into the Commission, was a stretched variant of the Jupiter rocket. Known as the Jupiter 246 Stretched Heavy, this variant of the Jupiter rocket looks nearly identical to what we have today with the SLS Block 1B a 212-foot-long, 27.5-foot-wide core stage powered by four RS-25 engines and two five-segment solid rocket boosters, with an upper stage powered by six RL-10 engines with a payload fairing on top of that and a crew Orion vehicle on top of that. It matches the SLS Block 1B incredibly well, but how do we know this isn't just coincidence? Well, we know SLS had to have come from either Cal-V or the Jupiter 246 Stretched Heavy at the time of the Augustine Commission, with the Shuttle C and EELVs being the only other two contenders. So among the Cal-V and the 246, how can we discern which one is the true ancestor of SLS? Well, it all comes down to the very top of SLS, or really, what's on top of both SLS and Jupiter that isn't on top of Cal-V? Orion. You see, CAL-V is an acronym that literally means cargo launch vehicle. The whole point of the CAL-V is that it would never launch a crew, never. It was a cargo rocket. This simple fact means that SLS fundamentally cannot be descended from the CAL-V because launching crew goes against literally everything that the CAL-V stood for. It is just coincidence then that SLS looks like CAL-V because Jupiter was forced to look like CAL-V in that ATK said they would not build boosters for a rocket with less than five segments, forcing Jupiter to abandon the shuttle four-segment and tank design and stretching their own design to accommodate this. And in the end, an inline shuttle-derived super-heavy lifter with Orion on top was indeed selected as America's new rocket over commercial rockets, the Shuttle C proposal, and yes, a dual launch system with a crew launch vehicle and a cargo launch vehicle. The great irony here is that after rejecting the Jupiter rocket when it was originally proposed, it was the Jupiter rocket that got selected in the very end, meaning that, had it not been for the ESAS paper and the Ares-5 rocket, SLS could have been operational close to eight years earlier than it was in our own time. In the end, SLS and Ares-5 are two incredibly different rockets. Sure, they may look similar on the surface with their orange tanks and SRBs, but looking closer, they could not be more different to each other. Born as Jupiter and the Cal-V around the same time to answer the same question, these two competing rockets pursued different strategies in order to achieve the goal of sending people back to the moon. But, just as with all competitions, there could only be one winner. And that winner was decidedly the Space Launch System. While Ares 5 certainly outclasses SLS in size and capabilities, it was the SLS who had the ability to adapt to the political environments of the time and come out on top as America's one and only moon rocket. When it comes to SLS versus Ares 5, SLS is the clear winner. Thanks for watching. Thank you guys for watching today's SLS video. I've been working on it for quite a long time, so I hope you were able to learn a thing or two today. But if you still have questions on exactly how SLS and Jupiter are related, make sure to tune in tomorrow at 12 p.m. EST, November 11th, for Jupiter Direct Live, a live stream that I will be co-hosting on my channel, featuring the engineers who actually designed many of the rockets you saw in today's video. It should be really fun, so make sure to stop by and hang out. Additionally, I would like to give shoutouts to my channel members, Felicia Vreeland, Would Die for Chamusuke, and Myers. Thank you guys for your support of this channel, it means the world to me. And with that, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow for Jupiter Direct Live.